so I, I got to follow that up. Obviously, we have this iconic background behind us. Um, you know, we really appreciate you making this happen. Ten years ago on September 26th, um, I know I know that date probably means a lot to you. Um, you walked out and, of course, um, history was made. Rivera threw his last pitch in the ninth inning. Um, uh, you know, some Bucknell fans and alumni might not know that you were the reliever that came in uh, two outs in the ninth inning. Um, even for somebody growing up on the West Coast and not growing up a Yankees fan, um, you couldn't help but be choked up at that moment with uh, with Andy Pettit and Derek Jeter coming out, taking the ball from Rivera. And of course, you were up next. What was it like to have a front row seat to that whole experience? Yeah, it was, uh, as I say all the time, it was the most surreal experience of my entire life um, as a, a lifelong baseball fan. You know, I wanted to take in the moment and I knew what it meant to him to Jeter, to Pettit, to all the fans in attendance, which it felt like a playoff atmosphere. We were already eliminated, but it felt like a playoff atmosphere in the stadium on that night. Um, so I was trying to enjoy it, but I also knew I had a job to do. Um, and I had to face Ben Zobrist. And, you know, the last thing I wanted to do was kind of, you know, walk a guy, give up a hit, give up some runs. And, and now I'm getting booed on his big night. So it was... <laughs> Probably the only time that I wanted to get off the mound as fast as I possibly could. And, and luckily, uh, three pitches later, I struck out Ben Zobrist and, and went into the dugout and, and just kind of tried to look around and take it all in. And it was absolutely amazing to be a small piece of that history. Bison Nation, Joel Morse, Senior Associate Athletic Director. I'm joined today with Todd Newcomb, Director of the Bison Club, and Matt Daly, Class of 04, Bucknell University. We couldn't be more excited to be here in Yankee Stadium with Matt. Matt, how's it going today? It's a beautiful day here as, uh, you know, Aaron Judge chases down history, so you can't beat it. Absolutely. Well, we made the trek over today from Lewisburg. On the way over, we were talking about just what you've been doing with your career for the fans out there and Bucknell alumni, can you just walk us through a little bit after leaving Bucknell, um, just walk us through your career. What happened next? Sure. So, um, you know, I was an undrafted uh, free agent out of Bucknell. I signed with the uh, Colorado Rockies for zero dollars, as I like to say. My signing bonus was a plane ticket to Casper, Wyoming. Nice. Um, and then I was kind of a guy that just moved a level every year. Um, I signed in 04 uh, after I graduated and I got to the big leagues in 09 pitch for uh, the next parts of the next five years in the big leagues between the Rockies and uh, and the Yankees. Um, and then as it was kind of winding down, had some conversations with uh, Brian Cashman and, and Billy Epler, who's now the GM over with the Mets, um, about a pro scouting role. Did that for three years and, and loved every second of it. Um, and then uh, in 2018, after three years scouting, I moved into the front office and Started as the assistant director of uh, pro scouting, became uh, the co-director, and then now is um, sole director of uh, pro scouting with the Yankees. Good deal. So I, I got to follow that up. Obviously, we have this iconic background behind us. Um, you know, we really appreciate you making this happen. Ten years ago on September 26th, um, I know I know that date probably means a lot to you. Um, you walked out, and of course, um, history was made. Rivera threw his last pitch in the ninth inning. Um, you know, some Bucknell fans and alumni might not know that you were the reliever that came in uh, two outs in the ninth inning. Um, even for somebody growing up on the West Coast and not growing up a Yankees fan, um, you couldn't help but be choked up at that moment with uh, with Andy Pettit and Derek Jeter coming out, taking the ball from Rivera. And of course, you were up next. What was it like to have a front row seat to that whole experience? Yeah, it was. Uh as I say all the time, it was the most surreal experience of my entire life. Um, as a, a lifelong baseball fan, you know, I wanted to take in the moment and I knew what it meant to him, to Jeter, to Pettit, to all the fans in attendance, which it, it felt like a playoff atmosphere. We were already eliminated, but it felt like a playoff atmosphere in the stadium on that night. Um, so I was trying to enjoy it, but I also knew I had a job to do. Um, and I had to face Ben Zobrist. And, you know, the last thing I wanted to do was kind of, you know, walk a guy, give up a hit, give up some runs. And, and now I'm getting booed on his big night. So it was 
probably the only time that I wanted to get off the mound as fast as I possibly could. And, and luckily, uh, three pitches later, I struck out Ben Zobrist and, and went into the dugout and, and just kind of tried to look around and take it all in. And it was absolutely amazing to be a small piece of that history. Do you remember any of those pitches or was it all just muscle memory at that point? Um, I, I remember the first pitch was actually a ball, but I got a very lenient strike call and it, it helped me get into the moment and kind of lock in. So thank you to uh, the umpire for that call on that one. Awesome. All right, well, I got one for you. First of all, I got to put on the cap because I am a true Yankee fan. And I remember that night watching it and we were watching it with a bunch of the staff members at Bucknell and I remember hitting John Terry about 15 times and saying, it's Daly, Daly's coming in, it's Daly. When were you told in the bullpen that you were going to be the guy going out there? And what was that like when you realized what you were about to do? So I was actually warming up with Mariano in the eighth because Dylan Batances was on the mound. Um, and if he didn't get any outs in that inning, I was actually going to come in before Mariano. So I was kind of warming up and the fans were obviously going nuts out in the bullpen. Um, and once Dellen got the out, uh, Mariano came into the game and I thought that that was all I was going to have. I kept that ball. I put it right into my bag. I'm like, this is absolutely amazing. I put my jacket on. It's like, all right, now time to enjoy it. And Mariano goes in, gets two outs in the eighth inning. And then that's when they called um, and they were like, hey, just so Daly knows, he's going to come in with with two outs. And so, like, that's when, you know, the, the nerves start hitting. I, I, my, my heart is bound, uh, pounding out of my chest. And, you know, it, it just like, oh, boy. All right. You got a job to do. And and uh, and so, yeah, that's when it was it was the bottom of the eighth uh, that I was told. So you're a Long Island guy, right? Yep. Garden City, I believe, is where you're from. Yep. What was it like for you? You used the word surreal earlier, but what was it like for you when you wound up, A, playing for the Yankees, and B, now you're working for the Yankees in a, in a really important role for such a storied organization? I don't know. I, probably a lot of people at Buck now know this, but I actually grew up in Queens and Flushing, and I enormous Mets fan growing up. Um, I, <laughs> we'll I, give I, you that. We'll let that slide. I, I have pictures of myself in, in full Mets gear, strawberry jersey, everything ready to go. But still, my, my dad's a huge Yankee fan. Tons of family Yankees fans. My brother's a Yankee fan. Um, so I, I fully understand the weight of this organization and how much it means to the game. Um, so for me to be, again, a small piece of this organization and try to help this team win and, and try to chase championship number 28 um, is extremely, um, you know, uh, gratifying for me. What have you learned working with and being around with so many, you know, you're talking about it, the legends who have who have statues that are that are lined up at this amazing place, but being around them off the field. Is, is there anything you've learned? I know this organization means so much to the, to the New York community um, where you've watched these guys and, and some of the big names or even names that you don't hear about every day on what you learned throughout your career on how they pay it forward for the community. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, it's, it's said actually a lot by Jason Zillow in our media department. It's, it's do the right thing. And if, if you mess up, own up to it and stand up to the cameras and say, you know what, I, I messed up today. And I'm, I'm sorry about that. I'm going to try to do better in the future. Um, and really think about how that affects not only you and your family, but it affects the fans and it affects people who really care about this organization. Um, and I think that that's what you see out of the, the Marianos and the Jeters and the judges of the world who try to go about it the right way um, and give those fans um, you know, a great experience every time they come to the ballpark. And, and obviously, you know, paying it forward with Jeter with his foundation and, yep. and all the, the people that he has helped over the years. Same thing with the Steinbrenners and, and their foundation. So, um, yeah, just just try to, you know, kind of model myself after them and, and try to do the right thing at all times. Now, a big theme in, in this podcast, then now forever, Ray is paying it forward, like you mentioned. And we appreciate what you do for the Bucknell baseball program. I know Coach Heather and the staff and all the guys really appreciate it. Did that start because of your experience here in New York, or is that something after you left campus that you wanted to do no matter what you did with your career? Yeah, I, I definitely, listen, I, I absolutely loved my time at Bucknell. There is, the, it was the perfect school for me, um, you know, with, with the ability to play baseball there, but also knowing that the sole focus 
Uh, and the main focus was on my education. Um, I have a tremendous amount of respect and love for Bucknell University. Um, and, and, you know, actually playing wise, yes, where did it really come from? Um, playing with some really good uh, players in the uh, Rockies bullpen back mm -hmm. in the day, whether it was Josh Fogg, Glendon Rush, Randy Flores, um, Houston Street. And they really took care of me. Um, they wouldn't let me pay a bill my first couple of years in the big leagues. That's you know, they, awesome. they really tried to guide me in the right um, direction. What they would always say is pay it forward, Matty, pay it forward. Um, and so I try to do that at the end of my career. You know, when, when I was finishing up in AAA, I tried to be almost more of that, you know, coach slash player um, and try to guide, you know, some of the younger players in the right direction as well. And, and try to tell them that, too, is like, yeah. you know, don't pay me anything. Just try to pay it forward to the next generation. That's awesome. So let's take it back to the then. Let's talk about how you wound up at Bucknell. Tell us about yeah. your recruiting story and, and how you wound up as a member of the Bison. Uh, my recruiting story is I wasn't recruited by anyone. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the really, the, actually, the only school that really truly recruited me was Johns Hopkins. Um, and I actually thought I was going to go there, but I didn't get in. So, um, you know, I, I knew that I wanted to stay in the Northeast, Mid-Atlantic area, went on the Lehigh Lafayette Bucknell tour, you know, went to Maryland and Delaware, went down into the Carolinas and UNC and NC State, Duke. Um, and Bucknell was just the one that I, I kept coming back to. Um, it just felt right every time I stepped on the campus. Um, and then having a kind of dichotomy between Lehigh and Bucknell. When I met with Gene Depew, um, you know, he was fantastic the entire time. He said, listen, you know, we, we obviously don't have scholarships here. Um, I, I don't know whether you make the team, but, you know, I consider you a preferred walk on. And, and I think you have a chance to help this team win some, some baseball games where when I went to Lehigh, I got flat out told you don't throw hard enough to pitch in the Patriot League. <laughs> and that stuck in my my head still to this day, obviously. Um, but I remembered it during my playing career at Bucknell and kind of wanted to shove it up, you know, there, you know what. <laughs> so we're, we're we, glad. We, thank you, Gene, for all of this, <laughs> yes, of course. <laughs> right, right. So you mentioned Gene, right? Hall of Famer, um, so much respect uh, from so many people that went through the program. Talk about what he meant to you as a player, as a person, as a coach, and maybe dig deep and share one of your Gene Depew stories. Well, I'll try to keep it clean uh, with the Gene Depew stories. But um, when I think of Gene, I just think of what an amazing human being he was. Um, he truly cared about everyone on his team. He wanted them to um, not only obviously play well on the field, but become men. Um, and, and, you know, I, I was telling you the story um, where a lot of guys that I played with in the SEC, the, you know, the, the Pac-12, the ACC, they're college coaches basically told told them it's baseball first yep. and it's it's um you know academic second where gene was the complete opposite um and he followed through on it if you had class scheduled during um you know practice he would let you go to to class and he would you not even let you he would say go to class i was able to study abroad in australia um and he was totally fine with that so he really emphasized um you know academics and and trying to create uh, uh us into men um and so that's that's really what I remember. I remember, you know, he would have uh, parties out in his backyard um, for the team every single year and have his family there, have his little kids running around who ended up going to Bucknell yeah. um, and just tremendous memories about him. Uh, as far as stories, there's a few too many to tell uh, and some I won't tell. But what, <laughs> one thing, for whatever reason, um, I always just thought it was funny on our trips. No matter where we stayed, we knew right down the road would be an old country buffet. <laughs> he had to eat at an old country buffet. It was nowhere else. It had to be cheap, to be economical for, you know, the Bucknell budget. Um, and it had to have tons of food so that, you know, he, none of us would go hungry uh, down the line of the rest of the trip. The old country buffet and nobody wanted to drive in the van with Gene because he wasn't the best driver in the world. But. Yes. So yes. and aside from Gene, obviously, Coach Heather. Yeah. What did he mean to you in terms of how you developed as a player and as a pitcher? Here you are walking on to the team at Bucknell, and then you become a professional baseball player. Well, I actually just missed Coach Heather. So he came in in 2005, which was the year after um, I had already graduated. Who was your pitching coach? So my, my pitching coach was Rick Sassoni and, oh, and RJ okay. Grant. Um, so those two guys, and actually still 
It's funny, actually, um, RJ and my son play together on a 7U travel team here in, in New Jersey. No way. Um, so it's amazing how things kind of come full circle and still keep in contact with Rick. Um, and, you know, again, just obviously they were younger guys having just graduated from Bucknell themselves, but tried to instill some of the values that we're talking about right now and, and making sure that we all do things the right way. Go ahead. I was just going to say, as a, as a follow-up to this, kind of holistic development, if you will, for a Bucknell student athlete. You had the great experience you talked about studying abroad. You were a member of uh, Greek life as yes. well, right? Yeah. What, what did that mean to you? What Did that play a big factor in your decision to come to Bucknell that you were going to have those opportunities off the field? Yeah, it absolutely did. Um, just knowing that I was going to be able to get the full college experience, um, you know, get to play baseball, uh, get to potentially travel abroad, uh, obviously top notch academics, uh, and also have some fun while I was there too. Um, and, and in a beautiful setting in, in the middle of uh, Pennsylvania. Um, like I said, you know, every time I stepped there on campus, I, my heart just kept being like, this is, this yeah. is the right place for you. That's awesome. So we, we talk about being champions, both in the classroom and on the playing field, and you were able to do both at Bucknell Talk about the two experiences you had in the postseason and, and what you guys were able to do during the four years you actually played for the Bison. Yeah, so we won um, actually two of my three years because I missed one of the years with Tommy John. So I actually didn't play my sophomore year at Bucknell. Um, so we won my freshman year. And then again, in my junior year, we got to go down to Miami, Coral Gables, and then uh, down to Texas and play in the Austin Regional. Um, you know, my first one was kind of just more, I was the, the last player invited. And, you know, I knew I wasn't gonna really get into a game and then uh, in Texas, we actually thought we had a chance. You know, we had Kevin Miller, who was uh, an ace at that point in the Patriot League. And, and we gave Texas a run for their money. Um, in, in the first game, we ended up losing. And then in the second game, same thing. We had Arkansas on the ropes. Um, and, uh, you know, I thought we all, I think we all thought we had a chance, but we weren't able to pull it out. Um, and, and still to this day, that's, that's one of the best teams I've ever played on. Um, you know, it was mostly juniors and seniors who've been playing together for three years at that point. Um, and I think we had a really good bond and, and we knew what we were trying to do. And, uh, you know, unfortunately just came a little short. And then as an alum, a few years after you graduate, the team pulls off the monumental upset at Florida State. Talk about what that meant to you. Uh, realizing where the program, how the program had progressed and where it was going at that point. Yeah, it was, it was fantastic to see. Honestly, it's, uh, you know, just like I was saying about our experience, I think we all thought we were good enough to beat some of those teams. We just weren't able to do it. So it was really amazing to see them finally get over the hump and, and beat one of those uh, blue blood teams. And, and I kind of equated to uh, in 2005, which was unfortunately the year after I graduated, when we beat Kansas in the NCAA tournament um, and watching, you know, Bucknell take down a team like that and, and everybody having a great time and, and all of us alums calling each other. And are you watching this? Can you believe this? It was very similar to that where, you know, a lot of us Bucknell got baseball guys got on the horn and, and we're talking to each other and, and just really happy for that group that was finally able to do you know uh, what we knew was possible we're doing a good job switching off here this is our first then now forever ray podcast together and we're starting at yankee stadium so it's pretty good I think, I think we've, this, Joel. I, we've set the bar <laughs> high um you know sticking with the postseason the team had a great run last year the guys you know are, are playing for a po for a patriot league title came up just short i know they were they were super bummed about it but it was a fun team to watch with all your experience that you have with player development and scouting and watching what guys are doing, not necessarily just superstars, but just guys that are making it to the big leagues and the minor league, which is which is incredible. What do you see? You know, what advice would you give for student athletes that are preparing for a season after coming up just short? I would say use that as fuel to your fire um, and really, uh, you know, bear down and work even harder than you did the, the year before. Um, so I think that that's one, just as far as work ethic, just recommit yourself, yeah. um, try to work even harder. Uh, and then two, utilize all of the tools that are available. It's amazing with the internet and, um, you know, all these facilities now out there, all the modern research, uh, all the technology, whether it's, you know, Rapsodo, Trackman, uh, Blast Motion for hitting, there's so much more information than there's ever been in the past. Um, and make sure that, you know, as we say, you're using every tool in your tool belt to try to get better. Yeah, awesome. So I'm gonna flip back now to your current job again. We're gonna go back and forth yep. a little bit, but, to this point, what has been the favorite part of your job or maybe one of the most memorable experiences you've had here with the Yankee organization? Um, 
So we're obviously now getting into playoff season, which means it's playoff advance mode, which means all of our scouts are now out scouting the teams that we could potentially face in the playoffs. And, and to me, this is the most fun time of the year. Um, you get to scout in a different way. You're more scouting of the strengths and weaknesses of the team rather than the pure evaluation. Um, you know, are there little things that we see that we can maybe take advantage of and, and get an out or, or maybe score a run, which we otherwise wouldn't have. And you get to see your work kind of uh, take form a lot quicker than it is on the evaluation side of things and, and the acquisition side of things. So for me, probably the highlight of the three years when I was scouting was playoff advancing the Houston Astros in 2017 yeah. um, and, you know, coming so close to beating those guys, even though they were cheating. Um, <laughs> I was waiting for it. Unfortunately, <laughs> I wasn't going to say maybe I'm not the best scout because I didn't hear the banging of the drums from the stands. Um, but yeah, that, that one, you know, I feel really good because they were a juggernaut offense. Yep. Um, and I was personally scouting their hitters and, and, and trying to help Larry Rothschild come up with some game plans of how to beat them. And, and we held them down in that series. And, and you know, we, we put them to the brink and, and I wish we could have. And I think we would have had a World Series had, uh, you know, they not been doing the extracurricular activities. That's great. So as the director of scouting, Talk about some of the components that go into that. That's a pretty broad term, really. Yeah. I mean, you're looking at the opponents you're facing, but you're also looking at for future players right. or for people that might become free agents that you can go after as an organization. What's your favorite part about that job? Um, everything is constantly <laughs> changing. There's yeah. no normal day to day. Um, there's always things that are coming up. Um, so yeah, so so our department is the professional scouting department. So basically anyone that signed a professional contract, whether it's with the 29 other teams or our own team, we are responsible for creating scouting reports and evaluations of those players. Um, and, and it's for acquisitional purposes. You know, it's for trades, for waiver claims, for free agency, and and you know, hopefully making sure that we're we're giving good advice and sound judgment to to Brian Cashman and to Michael Fishman and obviously to the Steinbrenners to hopefully make the best decisions that we possibly can when we're, we're bringing people into the Yankees. So if Brian Cashman brings in somebody that bombs, I'm going to blame you. <laughs> I'll, I'll wear it. I'll own it. <laughs> the good you know, thing I'm is giving you a hard time. The good thing <laughs> is it's it's a complete, you know, team effort. And, yeah. and obviously now it's not just, you know, one scouting report that um, is going to, you know, run away and, and make an acquisition happening. It's it's we're trying to send in multiple scouts to see players. Obviously, uh, the quantitative analysis department uh, is running projections on all the players. Um, you know, we have the baseball ops department, which is helping out in a lot of different ways. So it really is a team effort to try to figure out, put all the pieces together of what player, um, not only what the player is that we're acquiring, but what is the person and how would they fit on our team? Well, we'll have to talk to Coach Heather about getting some guys to come up through the system. I know they're trying. I know they're working really hard. Now, I got to ask you, you know, looking looking here at the downtown mm -hmm. skyline, um, we're in the Hall of Fame suite, which is incredible. This is a great area. We have thousands of Bucknell alumni that are so critical to our university's mission here in the city and metro area. What are the chances of getting an alumni gathering out here someday? I'm going to put you on the spot with this one. <laughs> well, hey, you let me know who wants to come, when they want to come, and, and I'll do what I can to try to make it happen. Awesome. Well, we sure appreciate it, Matt. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you again for making this happen. You're making all of Bucknell proud with what you're doing. Well, thanks for having me and, and Ray Bucknell.